आवाज क्यों नहीं आ रही है आवाज क्यों नहीं आ रही गुड इवनिंग ऑल हाँ आ रहा है वेलकम टू द वेबिनार ऑन वास्तु विद्या एंड okay i would request all to mute yourselves please and the speaker for the webinar vastu vidya and eco design and methodology uh, will be delivered by professor r jagannathan uh i would uh, like to start by giving an introduction to professor r jagannathan uh professor r jagannathan has been in academics for the past 25 years having started his teaching career with bms college of engineering department of architecture bangalore he is presently the principal of the ks school of architecture with a bachelor's in architecture from mit manipal and a masters in town and country planning from sap anna university chennai professor jagannathan also has a post graduate diploma in construction management from nikmar pune during his school days in chennai he was trained in bharatanatyam by the eminent scholar artist dr padma subramanyam this exposure inspired him to the field of architecture and subsequently took him into research into the field of vastu vidya during the course of his research he was guided by eminent scholars including shri prabhat kumar podar shri muniyangala krishna bhat and many others this study and research of more than a decade has led to a phd from the department of sanskrit university of madras under the guideship of professor dr s padmanabhan the research on vastu vidya has apart from interpreting the subject as an architectural design methodology has been adopted into practical application by offering consultancy for a large number of individuals institutions and industries the research has found practical applications creating harmonies of space and people dr jagannathan has presented papers in many national and international conferences and has lectured in academic platforms including the indira gandhi national center for arts ignca new delhi a warm welcome to you sir and we look forward to your presentation on vastu vidya as an eco design methodology over to you sir thank you architect priya katavkar thank you sir thank 
How do I share my screen, Priya? Now oh. you are still on screen. One second, sir. Could I minimize this? Yeah, ma'am. Can you stop sharing the screen? Yeah, I'll do that. <coughs> One second, sir. Hmm. Yeah, I'll stop sharing. I'll stop sharing. Yeah, you stop no, you are still sharing. <laughs> I think I stopped sharing. Uh, Premium, permit. Is my screen on? No, sir. Yeah. How do I share my screen? Oh, one second, sir. Uh, I have allowed multiple participants to share the screen. Yes. It's you who are still on screen, ma. Uh, I can see your video, sir. One second. Where am I? One second, sir. Just uh... yeah. Good evening, sir. This is Sainu S from Chennai. I think uh, you have a icon after the start video, right? Start share content. Okay. So can uh like. Yeah. Yes. Yes, I can see your screen now. Your desktop is visible. Yeah, am I on? Yes, we are able to see. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Srinivas. Yes. Shall we start? Yes, sir. Yes, please. Yeah. Good evening to one and all, dear friends. Uh, for my this little effort on my presentation on Vastu Vidya and Eco Design Methodology. Shall we start? Yes, sir. Yes. Yeah. Good evening to one and all, dear friends. Uh, for my this little effort on my presentation on Vastu Vidya and Eco Design Methodology. Uh, in today's exercise, I shall be trying to present a little bit of in-depth movement into the subject. Essentially, the exercise is trying to facilitate uh, for professionals, architects especially, to understand the research possibilities on the subject and also the application. I shall now move on uh, into the whole presentation. What I would like to do is make a quick presentation of the whole process and then we can open up for an interactive discussion. We shall start with the salutations. Desha Kala Padat Mata Yad Yad Vastu Tatha Tata Tad Drupena Yad Ya Bhavati Tam Shaye Sambidam Kalam which means I salute her, the Sambit Kala, who shines in the form of space and time, words and their meanings, and in the form of all things which are in the universe. I'll start off with giving a, a brief uh, you know, introduction about the literary sources on architecture among the Indian literature, because this is something which many people would like to understand and you know uh, so i these are the uh, source texts which i started off trying to understand of course you know under the literature category we see the vedic literature in the subcategories you know we have veda and samhita in which you have the 
no rig yajur no sama vedas atharva veda and all these subjects and then you have the brahmanas the upamedas and the sutra works now these are the broad no subjects on which the contents of the subject are available from this you know we have the atreya brahmana satpada brahmana and shilpa veda and samyukta griha sutras and ashvalayam griha sutras which are giving a detail about the subject going a little bit more on the shilpa works which are relevant to this particular subject we have you know broadly two schools which are categorized the maya or the dravida school of hindu architecture and the vishvakarma or the nagara school of hindu architecture in the maya school we have a whole list of texts starting from the kamika gama karna gama manasara maya mata agastya skalandhakara vastu purusha vidhana manushyalaya chandrika shilpa ratna shilpa samgraha and so on and in the vishvakarma school of architecture we we have the vishvakarma vastu shastra samarangana sutra and so on no, uh, yukti kalpataru aparajita pracha vastu raja vallabha mano man, manno lasya vastu ratnavali vastu muktavali bhuvana pradipa and vastu shastra pratika and so many more these are the few i have just listed uh there are you no know, uh, commentaries available on these texts in the printed form in the market today but most of these commentaries are in sanskrit or in hindi for this text which are available in the market there are very few i would say literally hardly any literary which are available in english now we will get into the subject essentially you know we try to understand the subject why and what of it the word vastu etymologically means the place where people dwell vasanti pranino atra from the root word vas to dwell nivase the place may either be the ground or land on which people reside or the house and the other buildings people build for their use so it could be the site as we generally call them and also it is the built form that into which people go and live so the word vastu refers both to the site on which the buildings are raised and to the buildings themselves essentially we should remember before i get into the next slide you no know, the shastra very clearly defines and states that this activity is made for the comfort and safety of the humans to dwell and grow so the whole process of creating such a space is facilitating to convenient and comfortable living and safe dwelling so that we can grow into our higher lives of spheres in our life thus the early vedic references suggest that the buildings especially the houses were more important than the plot or land in which they stood the vedic word for house is vishma meaning that in which people enter it could be decorated consecrated and rendered charming and beneficent like the abode of gods this is very critical because aesthetics sense of beauty is a critical part in any human feelings and thought if you look at a small newborn baby and show a beautiful rose flower 
to the baby, the baby, baby immediately recognizes and expresses its happiness by giving a beautiful smile. So this appreciation of aesthetics is an innate part of human nature and the Shastra says the space in which we live, maybe the house or the place where you work from or the place from you learn, any such space should be aesthetically satisfying. In fact, the Atharva Veda even speaks of the spirit that chooses to dwell in thus built houses. It speaks of the gods in the spear, which include Indra, the chief of gods, Vayu, the god of winds, Pragna, the god of rains, Rudra, the god of thundering clouds, and Marut Devatas, the gods presiding over breeze and currents. Hello. Yeah, if you note yes, here, yeah, if you note here, the various gods that are mentioned over here are essentially the various elements of nature which facilitates comfortable human sustenance and living on this earth plane. And therefore, they are not something which is to be no, uh, looked at purely from the ritualist form as we generally understand in today's mindset. The later literature, the gods of this realm were personified as Dik Palakas or the guardians of the eight directions. Even as the lord of the heavenly region, Surya got structured into the nine grihas. Vastospati as the protector of the house, the griha, or site on which the house rests, or the griha kshetra, is intimately related to the stars and planets above the guardian deities and around. Thus, there are references to this art or science or as we may even call it art and science, having been assodiously cultivated by a long line of wise sages and expert architects. In the Matsi Purana, the chapter 226, for instance, provides a long list of 18 experts who handed down this art in a traditional manner. They include Brugu, Atri, Vasishta, Vishwakarma, Yama, Narada, Nagnajit, Vishalaksha, Aniruddha, Sukshukra, and Brihaspati. There are, of course, many more, uh, but these are the few probably important experts who have contributed into, contributed into this growth of this knowledge. Further, the text states that Vishnu, in his first incarnation as Matsya, delivered in brief this discipline to the first mortal Manu. Vastu as art or science of architecture comes in elaborate treatment in the Agamas and the Shilpa Shastra texts. Among the topics discussed in great detail in the Vastu Purusha as unified personification of forces and spirits that dwell in the sites divide into number of cells or the padas. The conception of Vastu Purusha is essentially an abstraction based entirely on the site plan or what we call as a padavinyasa and that the Vastu deities of the plan cells must properly be propitiated 
before construction of the site commences. This is very important as we see in this supporting sketch, which has been translated from the shlokas uh, into a site application, you know, where the various deities are established in a given space. Now, we should understand that again, when we say these deities, as I will show in the later part of this talk, how these deities actually form the actually the part of the human body system. So they are not something which is outside our world, but they are very, not only within this world sphere, but also very much part of our own uh, living system and our own physical bodies. Sorry. Yeah, so thus the planning of a house with regard to corner lines or the corner rekha and pole lens, the danda with different directional orientations become relevant. For instance, if the pole lens run east-west, it is called Uddaya Danda and it is good. And if on the other hand, the pole length is south-north in the orientation, it is called Yamadanda and it forebodes destruction of the family. Hence, the architect must plan in such a way that the evils of the poles are avoided. There are many defects that one must avoid in designing a house. Defects pertaining to site cells that are called as padagatta, defects in the moat area of the site, pratika ghatta, defects in the force lines in the plan, pathagatta, defects concerning the availability of water, jaladosha, defects emanating from the plants and trees around the spaces of residence, or in this case, say an example of a house known as vrikshadosha. These defects are set to forebode loss of children, wealth, health and happiness in a given space. Thus, if you see in this image, uh, how the dandas are to be laid out and how based on the orientations, the various activity spaces may be laid on based on the deities which relate to those specific locations. Now, there is a very interesting relationship between this form of a layout to that of the human body. We will see what it is. If you look at it, all Indian architecture has grown out of a subject called the Sulabha Sutras. To apply the principle enunciated in this aphoristic texts to buildings for religious and personal use, they had to make relevant changes with omissions, additions, and alterations. The expression vyuha pratyuha is interesting. Vyuha is conjecture or hypothetical reasoning for appropriate additions, functionally relevant and structurally viable, and pratyuha relates to omissions. The Manasara insists that whatever the spiritual injunctions, a clever architect must use his intelligence and discretion to make the building useful and delightful. The counsel of the expert architect is of great importance than canonical principles as, if you, as you see in this following shloka. So therefore, the vyuha pratyuha that I mentioned in the earlier slide is very critical because there are a 
set of canons or guidelines that are given they are not canons they are not scriptures which should be very blindly and rigidly followed but they are guidelines which should be understood and enunciated to the development of the design process so that the space that is created is useful and delightful that's very important Coming to the next part, I'll I'll just move on to you know to show you how how these uh, issues are connected to the astrological considerations and down into the human body, because for at the end of the day, you no, know, we create a space for the beneficial use. of the human beings thus in the brihat samhita varaha mitra sets about to explain the art and science of architecture which has been handed down in a long line of sages for the edifications of clever and interested astrologers there are considerations like ayadi shadvarga which is a very very set of important formulae concerning six main proportions this term proportion is a very very important aspect in the subject of architecture they include aya vyaya riksha yoni vara and thiti together with amsha relevant for the sanchian type of buildings thus to confirm to the six main architectural limbs thus they relate to the a base a column tabulature wings roof and the copula or the dome of any structure these are very typical parts of most building proportions these formulae involve astrological details with numerical correspondences while aya relates to the numbers 12 vyaya to 10 riksha to 27 or uh, 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 riksha is also uh, some places defined as nakshatra or and yoni to 8 vara to 7 thiti to 30 and amsha to 9 if you notice in this you know the astrological or astronomical data have been con converted into architectural applications so that you achieve the right and relevant proportions which have to be achieved in any living space thus the measurements pertaining to the breadth the vistara by formulae under vyaya and yoni and those pertaining to the height by the formulae under vara and thiti have to be achieved the calculations are meant to predict gain or loss by the principles like those quoted above in these in the words pujyam etc there are no i i have just uh, will not go into the detailed text shlokas but i'm just giving you some enunciations for you to get an idea as to how these concepts have to be translated into actual architectural design methodologies thus the drishtantam or the import for architect is the site is a place or ground on which a building structure or city stands or once stood or will stand life is expressed in architecture and they must merge and mingle this is very critical architecture and life are to be one the human body is a temple of god the architectural edifice houses humans and other beings and this is very important because the import or what an architect understands from the scriptures or from the texts is very critical since this facilitates the title of my today's topic 
as I said, an eco or ecological, ecologically sensitive design methodology. This is why I call today's topic in the above way, because it clearly understands you know, that, that architecture and human life are to be equally respected. And this quality of life has to be expressed in architecture by both mingling together and achieving a functionally and aesthetically satisfying space. The areas that belong to the forces on a site, as I enunciated earlier, can be distinguished. The instrument that helps to distinguish this is the mandala. The mandala is a celestial graph and has plots or quarters in it, which are created by equal subdivisions on both sides. Some of these plots or quarters represent divine forces while others represent demonic, animal, plants, and other quality or adjectives of a human nature. The architect is to harness these forces through his design process. The mandalas help in achieving this. They guide the planning and positioning of various elements in a given site. They provide answers to the locations of the various activity of such as a kitchen as well as a parliament house in a larger planning scale. The mandalas are also used in Indian dance to perform on stage and they are also used to perform various sac sacrificial rituals. The forms of a mandala can be varied from a square, rectangular, triangular, or circular. Thus, you know, the common perception today that a, a, a vastu compliant uh, structure needs to be only a square or at best a rectangular is not right. The structure could also be circular or even triangular in form both in plan and elevation or as a form structure. The commonly used, of course, uh, form are the square and rectangular because of their optimum use of space and energy. And of course, the square is an economical form. Nature the governing power of cosmic process in the universe is omnipresent. Nature governs every piece of land and every dwelling. The scriptures refer to this as the presiding deity. This spirit in architectural parlance is called as the Vastu Purusha. Vastu in architecture a dwelling or a site, Purusha is the presiding spirit or governing nature. Thus, if you notice in the whole process, you know, the space that an architect and the client together create is not just a structure which is only of mud, mortar or cement and mortar or a stone and mortar and stuff like that. It is actually a living entity. And that respect has to be given to any space. And this Vastu Purusha lies in a particular posture on the celestial graph that is the Mandala. The sum total of the site the presiding spirit and the mandala is known or popularly called as the Vastu Purusha Mandala. Now, what is the posture of this Vastu Purusha? The texts speak of the 
presiding spirit of the site lies in a hump-backed, crooked and lean posture according to the Manasara. His middle body, the torsos assigned to the plots or quarters are located to the Brahma, which normally are kept open to the sky. The spinal cord of the Vastu Purusha is fully bent and gives the impression of two spinal cords, the major and minor. No, this is what I referred to earlier as the dandas. The major spinal cord extends from the east to the west and to the north, and a minor one extends from the west to the south. This explains the humpbacked, crooked and lean posture of the Vastu Purusha. His head occupies the plot or quarters allocated to Aryaman. The head lies in the northeast direction, which face with the face turned downwards. This means his neck is sufficiently bent to indicate the northeast direction, like an orientation arrow that we use nowadays. The left side, the arms and the thighs, occupies the plot assigned to the Bhudhara. Now, this is the translation of the shloka which defines the Vastu Purusha. We will just look at the further aspects of the shloka and then I will show you how this shloka has been translated into an image. The left hand occupies the plots assigned to Apavastha. It is stretched out to the corner by the corner line of the northeast. The left foot occupies the plot assigned to Rudra and is stretched out by the corner line of the southwest. The right side occupies the plots assigned to the Vivasvat. The right hand occupies the plots assigned to the Savitra. It is stretched by the corner line of the southeast. The right foot occupies the plot assigned to Indra and is stretched to the corner of the northwest. The testicles occupy the plots assigned to Mitra. Now, when this entire shloka is translated, this is how the form of the Vastu Purusha lies on a given plot. It is very interesting to note, note that the ingenious method of our ancestors to have conveyed this idea over several thousands of generations without any distortion. This, in my opinion, has been achieved by a simple method of converting the whole concept of the image into a text or a shloka. This, no, the shloka can be easily learned by heart in the mind of the human beings and it can be conveyed orally from generations to generations. And this is what has been happening in our culture. And as and when it is required, the architect who understands the text translates them into an image and the image is then applied and used into the design process. By this, one interesting aspect that is achieved is that there is no loss of information or distortion or confusion amongst several generations of people. This text was written several thousands of years back and sitting here today, individuals like us are able to translate this and create the form which we can use as a part of our design process. Therefore, we are able to get the best of benefit of involving the physical, the psychological and the subtle of the various parts of the human body and of the spatial area into the design process. So this, in my opinion, has been a very, very successful model 
that our ancestors have created. Just imagine, you know, if our ancestors had made this into an image and left it, maybe in some uh, you know, temples, they had uh, you know, carved this out. Today, we would not have been able to understand what is it that they have done. And mind you, the images are also very much there in many of our temples in a very subtle manner, which we should be able to recognize and interpret and understand. Even that, we find it very difficult because there has been a gap between the perception and understanding of a particular generation in a particular period of time to that of our generation in our period of time. So then there could be possibility of misrepresentation, which could lead to misunderstanding and confusions in the whole process. Thus, leaving this information by way of textual process and the methodology of writing this text by way of a shloka, simple no, uh, poetical interpretations has made it very easy for people to maintain and understand the whole process. And thus, they have been able to sustain the whole knowledge system over millennia. And very interestingly, if you notice in this image, the image of the Vastu Purusha, and if you took, take a modern day sonography image of the baby in a mother's womb, it has a very, very close resemblance. Now, this Vastu Purusha, therefore, is an interpretation of the physical, of the psychological, and of the subtle or the psychic part of your client into your design process. Hence, while designing, due care must be taken to ensure that the marmasthalas or the nerve centers, all the vulnerable points of the Vastu Purusha or that of your client are not put to pain. Hence, structural members like columns, walls, fireplaces, or anything that can cause pressure or pain to the Vastu Purusha must be avoided. As the Mayamatam says, the wise man must avoid tormenting the limbs with the limbs of the house for otherwise innumerable sorrows will befall the limbs of the owner of the house. Very interesting approach. To see how it, this relationship happens between the human system and the Vastu Purusha Mandala, we see there are the three broad parts of the human body. The physical part, which includes the skeletal structure in the nervous system, the psychological body, which includes consciousness, thought vibrations, mind, and the subtle bodies, which are formed by the chakras, nadis, and the panchakoshas. These are all integrated and incorporated into the entire architectural design process. As I was mentioning earlier, how very interestingly our ancestors have understood the entire human body we will take a small part of this the key part of the human body which we can say the brain and the spinal system now in modern medicines this is divided as you see in the image the brain the cervical part the thoracic part the lumbar and the scrotum now, this, of course, you no know, today's modern knowledge system, technology has taught us in very deep detail. And you go to a, a, a neurologist, he will give us amazing insights into the beautiful structure of the internal part of the human body, the core of a human body. If you look at the subtle body, which evolves around this, physical body, you no, know, like as though 
the way a beautiful woman is wrapped in a wonderful kanchipuram silk sari we see how the subtle body is also working on this physical part in this image you see the various positions of the chakras how they are located into the different parts of the body the text says there are six chakras or the dynamic tattvic centers in the body starting from the mooladhara swatishthana manipura anahata vishuddha agnya which are described in the different shlokas and all of these finally culminate into the sahasra padma as you see in this image there is a very beautiful relationship between these chakras and the celestial bodies the form of the human body has supplied the motive of conception to the indian mind of everything that ought to follow nature to its advantage accordingly even in designing of spaces the human frame provides the model for this design thus the vastu purusha is related to the human body at the physical at the psychological and at the subtle levels the no the uh, quoted shloka actually is the explanation for that which says surya is the presiding deity of the mooladhara chakra while chandra the lord of the stars over the swadishthana kuja the son of earth presides over the manipura and buddha reigns over the anahata chakra in the heart region guru is the deity of the vishuddha chakra in the throat region shukra is the deity of agnya chakra which lies in between the eyebrows shani the son of surya rules over the sahasrara chakra in all the marma points of the nadi reside rahu ketu and gulika and the shloka further goes on i salute to all these divinities for longevity and so on and so forth is the detail of the shloka now the interpretation is how this various celestial bodies relates to the different parts of the brain in the human body it says the surya relates to the thalamus chandra relate to the hypothalamus mangal relates to the red nucleus buddha subthalamus guru globus pallidus shukra and you no know, the shani and the various various deities let me not start reading them and i you know it it you know give the details we can look into it now therefore the mandala system a celestial graph helps infuse a harmonious character into the design of buildings or settlements sustainability any site is imbued with different characteristics good and bad in the language of the mandala they are defined as divine and demonic forces the suitability of forces in each quarters has to be weighed against the requirement of the project nature man structure and site must be closely knit planning through the mandala helps to achieve this as the brahmat samhita says in the shloka the gods always enjoy surroundings of wooded areas or groves rivers mountains springs and towns with pleasure gardens that's how you no know, bengaluru once upon a time known as the garden city was such a beautiful city today as planners and architects we must we must you no know, uh, look back and see what our city was and what we have done to it today by removing or reducing 
these beautiful spots in our city and making it into a concrete jungle, thus removing the gods from amongst our amidst. As planners and architects, I'm sure we should now see ways and means of how we should do the development of our settlements and towns by bringing back the gods. Because the site has to please the gods. The joy experienced in the presence of natural surroundings, mountains and mountains and undulating land, flowing water, Thick foliage is universal. Its soothing effect is reflected in the healthy and peaceful living of man. It is true that not all sites are richly endowed with these natural elements. Where they are absent, they must be created and maintained. Thus, the role of landscape architecture is very, very critical and becomes an integrated part of urban planning and architecture. In fact, in today's architecture, the new course or emerging course, as I would say, even in today in India, is what we call as urban design, speaks of designing and developing settlements or cities with a view of the third dimension, which includes the gardens and the water bodies. And the buildings and site must make provisions for nature. So a barren concrete stretch of compound cannot bestow upon man the gifts of nature. To conclude, I would say the universe consists of a Mahabrahmanda, a grand cosmos, and of numerous Brahmabrahmanda or microcosms evolved from it. As is said by the Nirvana Tantra, all which is in the first is in the second. In the latter are heavenly bodies and beings, which are microcosms reflecting on a minor scale in the greater worlds which evolve from them. As above, so below, the mystical maxim of our West also says. Finally, consciousness is the most basic element of everyone's life. Knowledge of consciousness is the most basic requirement for anyone to exist consciously and intelligently and enjoy complete, unbounded creative potential of life with maximum success in all fields of personal and professional life. Creating the right living environment helps in facilitating this vital link with the ultimate reality. Thus, the space, place where we live and work, has to be the platform for this link. Architectural design based on the Vastu Purusha Mandala is expected to be one major step in this direction, thus establishing the hypothesis. Yedihasti tad yantriya yannehasti na tad what is here is elsewhere. What is not here is nowhere, the Vishwanmara Tantra says. I conclude my presentation by quoting this. Honor the place in which you, in you, in which the entire universe dwells. I honor the place in you which is of love, of truth, of light and peace. When you are in that place, and you and I am in that place in me, we are one. Namaste. Thank you for the wonderful time. I will now open up to anybody having any queries. To my limited knowledge, I will try to answer them. Thank you. Thank you, sir, uh, for such an informative and interesting presentation. Uh, we do have some questions here. Yeah. Uh, there's one from architect Kavya, which is the School of Architecture. She wants to know, uh, like, if we do not design according to Vastu, 
For example, if we keep a washroom in the southeast corner, uh, there would be some negative energies that will be generated. She actually wants to know how much time or how many days uh, it will take for the occupants to feel the negative energies. Now, first of all, in a given space, uh, no, uh, it is very important that uh, you know you have to, as I said, you know, uh, in the earlier slide, that which is here is elsewhere, and what is not here is nowhere. Like you know, the 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 entire Earth sphere, for example, is a sphere where it has different features and characteristics, and one of the important features is the orientation. So where, that which is there in the macrocosm has to be replicated in the microcosm. So once you, as an architect, design a space, the first step is to create the definition of your space. For example, the earth has its boundaries, right? The, the, the whole earth is a sphere and there's a limit. At, after a point of time, you go out of the earth's atmosphere. And beyond by that, you also have a definition and then you have the orientations. Likewise, for your site also, you must first define the uh, no, definitions of your site, the peripheries, and then based on that, you must define the orientations. Once you have done that as an architect, only then the orientations work, and then the southeast, northwest, all this business happen. Okay. So the human body is a very dynamic element, and this dynamism of the human body you know, could react depending on the you know, uh, capability or you know, uh, ca features of the individual's capability. Uh, it, it will kind of uh, open up and react. So it all depends on the individual's uh, impact. You know? So it, there's no defined time or things for this. It can happen any, you know, it could happen in a day or two, it could happen in four weeks, it could happen in six months. No, it depends on the individual's strength and capabilities. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you for the answer. Yeah, welcome. Uh, there's a question from Tarun. Mm -hmm. It is said that the temple is designed in the idea of a sleeping human being. How is it so, sir? It is not sleeping. It is a lying posture. See, the human posture, as I said in the Vastu Purusha Mandala, no, is in the posture of a fetus in the mother's womb. Now, if you look at a sonography image, you know, the womb is always dynamic. It's in constant motion in the abdominal fluid. Now, this movement is to be captured at the particular look cap part of the you know, uh, posture. And that is what we use for the Vastu Purusha Mandala. Now, the image that we saw is the when the fetus opens out its hands and legs. There could also be the part where the, feet, uh, the fetus you know, crawls in and you know, holds its hands and legs back, which is normally an image of a fetus, which we see in many of our medical journals and images. That could also be used in some of the design processes. Like that, one may also use the posture of a lying human being, which is also popularly used as the posture of Vishnu, the celestial god, who is always in a lying posture, popularly represented in a lying posture. So one can also adopt it. So there is no, no such rigid uh, no, uh, posture that, has, that is defined. It is again the choice of the architect depending on the design or the spatial requirement that the posture has to be adopted and the mandala has to be designed and developed into the process on the superimposition of the mandala, the spatial design has to be created. Okay. Uh, is this also related to the Agama Shastra, sir? Very much, very much. As, as I said, no, in the beginning, no, uh, everything is there no, in the text. So the the you no know, like we see the you no know, the texts which are showing everything is very much in the agamas the Vedas you know, everything is there it is part of it you no know, see the whole subject is in the Vedas 
from the Vedas, you come to the you know, Upangas, the Agamas, and you know, various texts. So different kind of information is available in you know, different parts of the texts. OK. There's a question from Shweta. Mm -hmm. Is Vastu Vidya relevant to apartments too? Each flat will have a Vastu Purusha or individual building? She asks. Uh, well, uh, well, it's it's an interesting question because that is what the way largely people live today. You no know, uh, multi-level uh, livings, and uh, see the Vastu Purusha. Uh, the first part of your question to answer is relevant to any space which human beings use. Maybe a, an individual residence or an apartment or a, a commercial complex or an hospital or. A, or, or educational institution or an IT hub, whatever, whatever, including up to the level of a city. Now, the second part of your question, does each uh, unit uh, need to work? No, it will not be like that. You know, see, uh, an apartment should be probably conceptualized like that of an entire human body. The different uh, units or the different apartments that being like the different limbs of the human body or the different uh, you know, elements of the human body. So each one cannot be working in its own you know, direction. So it should all get integrated into one part. And uh, well, maybe that's how the architect should design it. So I don't see if it's uh, you no know, relevant to make each unit relevant to the, you know, the Vastu Purusha Mandala. It cannot, probably cannot be done that way. Okay. Uh, she also says, I have a lot of interest in the field of Vastu Shastra. I would like to know from your experience, from where to learn the science? Well, as I said, uh, no, uh, no, Indian knowledge system, as I always keep telling, you know, is a very vast, deep knowledge system. Uh, there are a lot of texts available, you know, uh, and most of us are unfortunately not very familiar with the language uh, in uh, you know, uh, which most of these texts are. That is, when I say language, it is largely in Sanskrit today and in many of our regional language, Kannada or Tamil or you know, Hindi uh, things, languages like that, Bengali, Kashmiri. You, know, uh, you have a lot of information in all these languages. But then unfortunately, you know, we are not very familiar with our language, especially at a technical level to understand uh, terminologies. And many times we rely on some English translations. But as I always say, you know, it was uh, you know, the advice of my you know, uh, guide and teacher, Guru, Dr. Padma Subramaniam, when she first uh, uh, no, suggested to me, when uh, no, advised me saying that like, uh, well, uh, the best way to appreciate Indian knowledge system is to read it in its own original language because the interpretation and uh, rep, you know, translation of different individuals could be from their own you know, points of views and their own situations and limitations. So sometimes or many times as we see in today's situation, there have been distortions. So it might be useful uh, that an individual should critically, I would like to emphasize on the word, critically you know, analyze and study the Indological knowledge system through our own you know, languages. I'm, I'm emphasizing on the word critically because let's not get carried away uh, saying that all that is Indian is great, fantastic, and let's not get into such jingoism. But certainly there is a lot of knowledge and over a period of time, there has been a lot of distortion and confusion and, uh, no, um, of this knowledge. So we should not get, be lost in that too. So what is important is to be critical. And as a researcher, we must be very careful to do this research. So honestly, I wouldn't, uh, no, I would only suggest going into the list of texts which I had shown in the beginning. You could use any of them to start your research and start learning the subject. Uh, a question from architect Raghavan. Uh, how is Vastu Vidya different for different buildings like homes, offices, etc.? And are Vastu Shastras available only in Sanskrit? Uh, 
the first part is you know it is it is not different uh, the broad design methodology remains the same as long as as the text zimsel say the human uh, body you no know, structure remains the way it is that is you no know, uh, one trunk one head two hands and two legs suppose human being at some time genetically like you know today we see how china has manipulated with this pandemic and somebody sometimes you know some crazy country like this starts manipulating start saying you know genetically messing up with the human system and people are born with uh, no four hands and no two heads then yeah maybe the vastu shastra the way it is proposed does not apply but so long as you know we are having the same human structure the shastra is applicable because it is meant for the evol evolution and you know uh, development of this human system at the physical at the psychological and at the uh, psychic level now that's part 1 now yeah the the shastras are applicable at the subtle level it remains this while it remains the same at the physical level one has to look at your site location and that's what as the you know the manasara text also says it leaves it entirely to the intelligence of the architect to interpret and use or compromise on this design process to the best advantage of the people who are going to use the site and the space to get the best of it so there 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 can be because there could be a climatic uh, situation or a specific site context which will have an impact and that is the discretion of the architect and that should be done no most often unfortunately these days no the public at large have uh, no uh, got into typically some of these uh, ritualistic understanding and they you know get fixed to this uh, relationship of the orientation and activities which is not beginning and end of the shastra process the design process uh, but then what is more important is the whole process of design so it is not very rigid as i would say it has a lot of flexibility but then the compromise has to be done in a professional manner because a compromise cannot be done by an individual that's why it becomes very sensitive the compromise should be done to the extent that it does not cause undue damage to the physical psychological or the subtle part of the human beings who are going to live in a given space lot of questions piling up sir one from manju arjun and how to do vastu remedy for an old building um well uh, an existing structure uh, as i've done you uh, know uh, i'm not telling what i've what i've do uh, my little research is the beginning and end as i say always you know what i've done is probably you know the scratch the tip of the iceberg there's a lot more to be learned and applied but then uh, what i i do is that my understanding is that uh, as i said a space works at the physical at the visual and the subtle level the human body works at the physical uh, no psychological and the subtle level now on this no if you see the three the subtle is the key and the subtle of the space has a very strong impact on the subtle of the human body and the subtle of the human body has a very strong impacts on its psychology and physiology now that being the case the exercise that i undertook was to try to understand how i can manage and manipulate the subtle of a given space to match the subtle of the people who reside in that space so that's we call as the energy of a given space and uh, you know uh, working at the energy levels so yes an existing space can be energized like for example even we have this in our tradition uh we have this concept of uh, say for temples uh, no at this uh, issue i would like to make a small clarification in the sense that uh, no uh, say for example temples have this concept of having doing a uh, no consecration no uh, every say 12 years 36 years and stuff like that 
uh, now that is re-energizing the temple. Of course, you know, uh, maintaining and uh, cleaning up the temple at the physical level and also at the energy level. And that's when we do what we call as this Kumbhabhishekam and you know, re-energize the rededicated the structure to the deities out over there. Now, this is possible and there is a method given for that and it should be done that way. But of course, there is no such a system given for a, a, a residential space, for example, for that matter, because uh, usually, you know, the temples or public, uh, you know, in those days, probably they considered temples as the most important uh, uh, space in a, for a society. And the temples were therefore constructed, the only the temples were therefore constructed with permanent materials like stone. The residences or any other spaces which were used by people uh, for civilian or defense related activities were always made of temporary materials, mostly timber. And after the lifetime of the Yajmaner or the person who had commissioned, say for example, the house, if I, I construct a house for myself, I am the, defined as the Yajmaner as the person who's commissioned the house and it is no it is to last during my lifetime at the end of my lifetime this building should not go beyond my lifetime and the materials are chosen in such a way because then again it has also got to be sustainable so the materials are chosen in such a way that they don't last for say maybe 100 years or 120 years max and uh, then you have to redesign and rebuild the structure so there is uh, in uh, traditional knowledge systems as far as i know no there is no uh, methodology to re-energize as the way they are given for temples but then as a part of my research the concept that has been adopted for temples is what i'm trying to adopt it up and apply it for civilian use that's what i do and it, I, i'm sure there, there could be many other you know uh, ingenious methods of arriving at such re-energization of spaces uh, a question from Utkarsh Mishra. So what about the textbook of Mayantam written by Sage Maya and describing various sites for various Varnas like business class, defense king, etc. Yeah, it is there. The Mayamatam is a very important text, it's a very popular text. It, it does give uh, you know, a lot of uh, you know, definitions. But I don't clearly understand what you're expecting in your question. Are you ask, asking uh, about the Varna relationship to a site or I don't know what you really mean? Okay, uh, while we wait for him to elaborate, yeah. uh, Vaishali has a question. She asks, if we have an old building, uh, which is wrong according to Vastu, uh, like the toilet in the southwest direction, can we add or subtract anything like landscape ideas to make it correct? No, see the point is anything can be done. It depends on finally what your uh, no, uh, uh, intervention impacts on the body of the people who are using that space. When I say the body, I mean the physical, the psychological and the subtle body, the psyche body of the people who are using that space. So it, 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 it is all, uh, no, depends. It, you could use any method as long as it is having the benefit impact on the subtle part of the body of the space. Firstly, if that can be positively impacted, then yeah, why not? It can be done. Of course, while doing that, we should ensure that the space does not get aesthetically and functionally distorted. Uh, Shweta wants to do her thesis in the field of spiritual science uh, and she wants to figure out uh, the exact topic. So she requests your views uh, on her thinking. I think she should contact you personally, sir. And, yeah, I would uh, appreciate if you could do that, whatever help. I'm not a spiritual uh, guru. Uh, I'm, I'm an architect. I'm a, you know, a teacher of architecture in my own limited uh, capabilities. So in my sphere of uh, knowledge and experience, whatever I can, I shall surely inform her. She can go through, uh, reach me through our college website, KS School of Architecture, kssa.edu.in. And whatever support we can, we'll certainly do. 
Yeah. Uh, uh, Manju Arjunan finds vast differences between South Indian and North Indian uh, Vastu. Uh, which one can you recommend? He asked. If I have to learn or study Vastu in masters where we can learn, I find a vast difference between South India and North India. Which one can you recommend? See, there are two aspects in architecture. No, an architect has a major role, as I would say, if you ask me, 70% of the role of an architect is to design a space. And the remaining 30% of the role of an architect is to execute, facilitate in construction of this design that the architect has visualized for his client. Now, the design methodology, the design process, there is no difference between North Indian, South Indian, Feng Shui, Geomancy, everywhere across the globe, it remains the same. Because as I said, the human body is the same everywhere. That's part one. Now, the other part of the design, which is the physical part, where you have to take care of your physical context, the land, the landscape, climate, the geography, the geology, they will certainly have an impact. Like for example, I said there were a lot of uh, you know, uh, features like the Padagatta and stuff like that. So no, those features are features of the specific site locations. So one has to consider that and those considerations have an implication on your design. Now that is one part. The other part is the construction part. So there again, your you know, or, or again in the second part, first part, second part is the climatic influence. So that will have an impact. So those all these issues are there, but the base, as I said, remains the same. The design process for the human body remains the same, not only in India, but across civilizations. We must try to understand that the problem today is you no, know, we are more focused on the thirty percent of the role of the architect where an architect is a facilitator to execute the design the architect has conceptualized for his clients. Please remember, I'm again and again completing my sentence, conceptualized for his clients. He does not, the architect does not design for the ego satisfaction of the architect alone. It is for the requirement of the architect's clients. So it's important that we should take care of that. And therefore, the conceptualized design needs to be executed, which is also there as a part of the Shastras to understand the you know, site, the geography, the geography, geology, the you know, uh, metallurgy, and all these aspects are there. And that, that, of course, will differ from location to location. And we have to be conscious of that. that, that that's why architecture is a, you know, it's a complex subject it, it's not as simple as it is made out to be today so so there is no one one rule which goes everywhere the same it will not happen and it is wrong to do that okay anup kumar has a question he wants to know any old city or town which is a classical example of the vastu concept any temple also as an example will be great there are umpteen number of cities and towns in India, starting from the most complicated city of Kashi, Varanasi. You know, is, you know, I think you know, it, it will be a big challenge if it use, uh, you know, for even the greatest of uh, today's modern planners to crack the way this city had been planned and executed in those ancient times not just at the physical level again i'm telling you no it we should understand how it was worked at the physical level at the psychological level and at the subtle or the vital level you know how all these three levels have been integrated and they have been used into the planning concept and like that any of our cities the cities of uh, you no know, various uh, you know, uh, towns like jaipur jodhpur coming down south you no know, kanchipuram udupi 
you know, uh, old cities, but the core area. I'm not, no, let's not get confused with the settlements of today's you know, expanded area. You can look at the study of the core area, do a study. Many of our old forts are very good examples, which are you know, uh, designed and executed, built on the basis of these concepts of designing principles that are given in the Shastras. Many, many spaces are there. And of course, temples, you know, you have the you know, various temples. Yeah, unfortunately, a couple of temples, many of the major temples in the north have been distorted because of the interventions of the different invasions over a period of centuries. But then uh, south has been lucky, east and south, I would say, has been lucky to the large extent. And uh, you know, some of the old uh, you know, temples in Assam, Bengal, uh, coming down to Orissa are great examples. The Puri temple is a fantastic example. And then coming further down into, into south, you have a huge number of examples in uh, you know, Karnataka and then Sri Rangam, Kanchipuram, many temples in Kanchipuram. And I would say the pinnacle probably would be easy, simple, but complex. Issues are integrated into the design you know, in the temples of Kerala. On the face of it, it may appear very simple. That is the ingenuity of the Indian architect. No, they have come out with a very, very simple you know, physical infrastructures, which is there, but in, it integrates into it very complex, subtle you know, uh, impacts on the human and the cosmic plane in those temples of Kerala and different temples in India. Uh, Vaishali wants to know if you could refer any Vastu book in English, uh, which she, uh, she can study. No, I, as I said, uh, no, there are many books. I wouldn't like to discourage or uh, no, bring uh, no comment on anybody. You know, everybody have their rightful positions in their own way. But then the right way, in my opinion, to do is look at it you know, in the original, depending on your you know, mother tongue. If you are from, say, Maharashtra, Marathi, there are Mara texts in Marathi, in Tamil, in Kannada, in Malayalam, in Kashmiri, uh, in Hindi, and of course, in Sanskrit, which connects to the whole of India. So I would think that is the you know, right way of doing justice to learning this subject. A question from Kum Kum. What aspects of Vastu Shastra remain unexplored largely when it comes to Vastu Shastra and historic or traditional buildings, apart from the fact that enough translations are not available for many texts? No, again, let me answer your first part, which I already answered in the previous question. No, let us not expect somebody to do the our work, especially for architects as architects. It is our responsibility to do the study and interpretation. I'm not telling translation. No, uh, no, uh, no. Western or English language may not be sufficiently equipped to translate the whole concepts, uh, no, into the right meaning. So it could cause distortions. So, but. It's certainly our responsibility to interpret and analyze in the regional languages. So, so that is that is what I would like to emphasize on. Sorry, I forgot. I, I confused the first part of the question. If you could please repeat that for me. Yes, sir. She wants to know uh, what aspects of Vastu Shastra remain unexplored. Uh, no, I would say the yeah the design methodology part is what remains unexplored. Because, say, for example, even in uh, the subject of, uh, say, Tachu Shastram in Kerala. No, Tachu Shastram essentially is carpentry, right? That's a beautiful knowledge system that has been you know, uh, brought down the ages. And it is very much in vogue today. There are many people who are actually using it. And in fact, if you look at even in the uh, Tamil Nadu uh, traditions, you have the... Uh, Thapatis, you know, who have kept the knowledge aware, aware and available in practice to a large extent today. But it is more at the iconographic level. Uh, what has been lost, I would say, or 
uh, kind of missed major portions have been missed is the design methodology part because that is very very critical and uh, even many sthapatis unfortunately have focused more on the iconographic part rather than the designing of the entire temple part based on the shastric guidelines that needs to be understood researched analyzed and re-established okay uh, we had an earlier question from utkarsh mishra he was asking about the maya matam uh, he has elaborated he wants to know about the varna relationship according to sites hmm. now see uh, well uh, the varna structure was the social structure in ancient india the, no, the manu dharma shastra speaks of the varna and maybe in today's uh, uh, kind of uh, what is a social structure what we could uh, probably uh, convey that into is a class system the caste system the way it was defined in the earlier is not there today it is largely distorted and uh, exploited uh, but then what is there today is uh, the class system which is a of course a, a western model based on your economic strength it's it's purely money and the rich i am i become higher class the lower i am i become the lower class simple and straight as that now that being the case no the point today is that the varna system how do you apply it is very difficult to apply in today's system uh one exercise that i have been trying and to work on is you no know, to connect the varna for example the four varnas the brahmana kshatriya vaishya and shudra are related to the physical structure for, or for example to put it more uh, you know uh, properly uh, a society is related like that of a human body and the four varnas are part of the limbs of the human body definition of a society so the brahmana relates to the face the kshatriya to the shoulder vaishya to the hip and shudra to the leg now there has been very clear that there is no part of the body which is superior or inferior and the manu dharma shastra if you say it also is very clear about it there is it doesn't say somebody some varnas are more superior or some is more inferior everything is important relevant in their own ways and they have to perform now having said that each varna is supposed to have a psychological characteristic and this is very interesting an exercise which i had done a couple of years back where we say that uh, you no know, each we, we took the manu dharma shastra and said like each varna's characteristic psychological characteristics were which are defined were listed out and the four varnas have been defined based on their psychology now there is a number of tests in the uh, psychiatric school of studies and one of them is known as a lucher's color test and uh, to my great surprise and excitement when i was studying and reading this lucher's color test methodology we found that they also define different individuals of course no they 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 define the individuals who come to them as a patient for a psychiatric evaluation but then they define the mental conditions into different features and some of these characteristics also fairly well fit into these varna characteristics so one way we uh, you know i was trying to apply this or impact work on this was to work on the the your client do an exercise on this lucher's color test do a study on the client and through that identify the varna of your client not from the client claims to be a brahmana or a shudra no not on that basis but then basis of this lucher's color test we evaluated and uh, try to work it out that and based on that the you know the site characteristics were defined that is one thing i did i'm again 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 let me put it very clearly all these are experiments and studies that are being done uh again in the field of humanities 
no it cannot be defined as this is right and this is wrong no there is a lot of conjectures and studies that are done but fortunately today a science has developed you know to a level where there are equipments you know technology equipments available uh, with which we can even actually check the subtle energies of the human beings and how they are being impacting on the individuals at this uh, you know point i would like to point out you no know, to all of you that you no know, see today the point on view of study of modern science that we are using is what we call as the newtonian sciences now newtonian sciences uh, you know essentially uh, work on the principles of physical proof for a very very long period of time for long centuries we have had our great scientists who have been experts on this and they have been experimenting and working on these lines and of late i'm sure all many of you would have also heard and worked on what we call as quantum science quantum biology quantum physics and all this stuff now in quantum science the difference is that they agree and understand today they also have proof through technology interventions about the energy part of everything in earth so the the quantum science you know breaks it down to that you no know, earlier we saw uh, for example human characteristics came from the genetic development of the human uh, no, uh, of a human being then there have been studies which you no know, ended up in a dead end in newtonian science which says where is the intelligence in the genes to keep this information into the genes of a person so that the family traits come through through the individuals and that's when quantum science has taken over and it says that there is a sheet of energies which cover these genetic molecules It goes into a lot of details of course and which says that that sheet of energy is the one which actually carries the memory or that is the brain if you can call of this uh, bodies so which keeps the information into it and passes on from generation to generation so that is what is quantum science and i think uh, you know as the new generations we should all start now seriously start looking at quantum science i hope you know uh, you know the new education policy looks at it and starts bringing emphasis on quantum science into our educational system and you know facilitates knowledge learning for our society thank you sir and uh, there's a question from tarun uh he asks when a pandit comes to visit our house and guides us to put some portraits of god or goddesses and mirrors in some particular places will it really solve the problems of vastu <laughs> if it's as simple <laughs> you know i think all of us would have gone to you know uh, become a mukesh ambani you know uh, and uh, it, it's not as simple as that but yes you uh, know uh, the the knowledge system does give ways and means of see the pictures or the uh, of our gods and goddesses are from an say architect's point of view i i look at it as an architect and i would say it's a form and every form has its impact on the subtle bodies of the human system so one has to understand a particular picture not necessarily of only a god or goddess of a hindu uh, no, uh, structure any any form we have to see if it works positively on the subtle body of the people who are living in that space and fixing it in a right position in the right direction light level gives that benefit we can do it it's possible but it cannot be a blind goose chase question from manju arjun and people are talking about landscape vastu is it true will plants have direction for vastu yeah very much as i said uh, no i don't know how many uh, you know people have done a research on the you no know, the landscape uh, elements of the shastras or, or of our traditions uh, but then yeah very much i can you know uh, tell you for sure 
the very much plants, trees, as I said, even in, during the course of the presentation today, have an impact on the you know, uh, health and well-being of the people. So very much, you know, it is there. It's only that one has to understand how these things to be used. Okay. That is, that's possible. And, and uh, of course, the point, what I would like to say at this point is again, is that no, the very interesting part of our Indian texts is that like say for example you take a text like say mayamatam somebody also asked it you know like uh, mayamatam is a text we popularly understand a text on the vastu shastra yes it is a text on the vastu shastra but mayamatam is not the beginning and end no like how for example in a in a contemporary book no you have you know uh, links that are given no you can connect say for example in a google page if you are looking at for some information no, there are some terms and words which come in blue. So you click on that, it'll take you to another site. So from there you get information, it keeps going. No, Like our traditional texts are like that. And the links are actually given in the body of the text itself, like your Google page. It does not give a footnote and say, do, uh, put it in an appendix and say, you go to this book and that book is in this page, you see, no, it doesn't give like that. It is give like, given like in your Google page itself, in the page itself, the link is given and one must know how to read it. There are very simple uh, you know, systems. Why if one le learns Sanskrit as a language, you, know, you will be taught how to use those processes of reading a book. So once you do that, then you can easily you know, get the connections of the links, which is given in the body of the text itself. From there you can go and it gives you all the details. No, go to different materials. That's why I said there is no one text. No, if you look at Mayamatam, then from there in a particular shloka, they would have given you a link. From that, you have to go into another text. From there, it gives you some other link. So it depends on what level you want to go, what you want to learn. Okay. I think we are looking at the last question from Utkarsh Mishra again. Mm -hmm. uh, is there any kind of Vastu in Islamic architecture? or other European architecture according to their aspects? Absolutely, yes. All human uh, no, beings need to live in a positive sattvic environment. No, uh, it, uh, no, the, of course, uh, the, as I again said, the basic design process evolves about the human body and the basic design process remains the same. But depending on the geographical, geological, climatic, and you know, uh, socio-religious patterns of the society, certain features have been added into the design systems, which have their impacts. It, 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 is, it might be Hindu, it might be uh, Islamic, it might be Christian, Judaism, you know, whatever, whatever. Religion is uh, only a means. Uh, I think uh, we've come to the end of the session, sir. And uh, thank you for patiently explaining all the questions. And uh, thank you, audience, for being such a wonderful audience, for participating so keenly in the session uh, and uh, uh, having the patience to uh, like put forth your questions in an, a very elaborate way. So thank you. Thank you all. And I would also like to thank... Uh, First and foremost, all the audience, people who've been with us for the last, I think, about one and a half hours. Thank you so much for all your valuable time. And uh, would like to thank our, my faculty team in the KS School of Architecture, especially our coordinator, architect Priya Katavkar, who has been you know, uh, in the forefront of organizing this session for today. And in fact, she's been uh, you know, along with our faculty, Mr. Rupesh, who has also you know, put in a lot of time and effort and our entire faculty team, I would say at K School of Architecture, you no, know, we work as a, you know, a very beautiful family of uh, you know, faculty team. And uh, with the support of our management, we are trying to you know, create an academic environment where we, we kind of research and intellectualize on the various aspects of architecture and human society for the benefit of knowledge and learning. So thank you one, one and all once again, 
and to my team of faculty. Thank you all. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. I shall end the session now.